And we're going to look this morning at the birth of Jesus and why we see this birth as uh, a true picture of joy. I want to um, mention to you uh, concerning um, Mandy Harrelson's, um, one of you reminded me of the fact that after her cancer surgery, uh, for any of you that know her, the report came back that she had no cancer in her lip nose, which is a wonderful blessing, and we praise God for that. Um, but continue to lift her in your prayers and lift Jonathan and that sweet family who is serving the Lord and uh, certainly want to uh, pray for them. Stand with me, if you will, as I read for us on this uh, Gospel of John, uh, Gospel of Luke, chapter 2. And um, we're going to see the birth of Jesus and sort of the story we're all familiar with, but. I'm sure as I, as I walk you through these passages, <clears throat> there'll be things that God will, will bring to our minds and attentions. Now in those days, a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that a census be taken of all the inhabited earth. This was the first census taken while Quirinus was governor of Syria. And everyone was on his way to register for the census, each to his own city. Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the city of Nazareth to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and family of David, in order to register along with Mary, who was engaged to him and was with child. While they were there, the days were completed for her to give birth. And she gave birth to her firstborn son, not only born, very specific here and very important, to her firstborn. Well, you see, Mary had other sons and daughters. She wrapped him in cloths, laid him in a manger, because there was no room for them in the inn. In the same region, there were some shepherds staying out in the fields and keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord suddenly stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terribly frightened. But the angel said to them, Stop be <coughs> being afraid, or behold, I bring you good news of great joy, which will be for all the people. For today in the city of David, there has been born for you a Savior who is Christ the Lord. This will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. And suddenly there appeared with, an, with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among men with whom he is pleased. When the angels had gone their way from them into heaven, the shepherds began saying to one another, Let us go straight to Bethlehem then and see this thing that has happened which the Lord has made known to us. So they came in a hurry. And they found their way to Mary and Joseph and the baby as he lay in the manger. When they had seen this, they made known the statement which had been told them about this child. And all who heard it wondered at the things which were told them by the shepherds. But Mary treasured all these things, pondering them in her heart. The shepherds went back, glorifying and praising God for all that they had heard and seen, just as had been told them. Lord, we thank you so much for your written word for us, that we can read it, we can think about it, we can ruminate on it, we can ponder it as Mary did. And Lord, as we walk our way through these verses, as we see the real definition of joy this morning, help us open our eyes, 
may we see wonderful things from this, your word. For it's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. In our last time together, we discuss the story in John chapter 2. The story when Jesus turned the water into wine. And we made several statements in that sermon about joy, how that Jesus restored the joy to an otherwise awkward and embarrassing wedding feast. To run out of wine in a wedding feast is just something uh, that, would have, that have, would, would have really affected them. And this is what Jesus did to begin his miracles, the very first one in Cana of Galilee. Jesus, everything that Jesus does brings joy. Matter of fact, in John 10.10, 10, he tells us, I have come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. Last week, I spent a few days with my daughter in New York and there was an abundance of joy in a certain elevator on the 25th floor of the Wellington Hotel. We were all crammed into this small old elevator on the 25th floor of this hotel. And as we descended, we stopped on the 24th floor. When the door opened, a person looked at the elevator and we were in there like sardines already. He just pushed his way right on in. So when he did, of course, for those of you that are claustrophobic, it would have been a terrible moment. But when he did, my sweet daughter, Andra, stepped over to the side to give him any possible room there was. And when she did, her arm knocked out about 12 of the hotel buttons. Now, you know what that means, right? <laughs> Now, everybody right around her saw what she did, and they immediately looked to me. And, but they didn't look to me with that English Mr. Bean, come on, attitude. They had a smile on their face. As we descended, stopping at every floor with no one there, the rest of the people in the elevator got it. Then it became funny. And instead of being an impatient, uh, what have you done? Oh, I'm in a hurry. We're going to be on this elevator for every floor for many, many rooms. Instead of that, people started saying like, this is, this is quite fun. And someone else said, when we finished the very last button that was lit, they said, this was so much fun. Let's do it again. <laughs> And when they said that, a lady, an English lady said, no, <laughs> no. Anyway, my point in bringing this up is that I don't know how that would have been in other situations in other times of the year. I can kind of guess, knowing what I know about that. But um, there was definitely joy in the air. And people were, were forgiving and merciful and people were making the best out of a, of a situation that could have been very, very uh, uh, irritating. And just uh, uh, the impatience that comes from stuff like that. Well, as I think about joy, I think about the fact that we do have a choice in the matter. Whether or not we choose to have joy or not. And I'm not talking about happiness. There's a difference, many differences between joy and happiness. They're on the surface, they look the same, but the differences are quite striking. Both are uplifting and enjoyable. But happiness is all about me. It is all about a self-focused emotion tied directly to me getting what I want. I've put my order in for Christmas dinner, baby limas. I've put that order in with plenty of time. If I don't get them, I will not be very happy. That is the surface. That is about as on the surface as you can go. 
Happiness is temporary at best and subject to our morals, or our mood, or our circumstance. Joy, on the other hand, run, runs beneath the surface, runs beneath the circumstance. Joy is the hope that we have in God. Something that nothing can take away. It is something that God has given to us himself. I found a verse in Philippians chapter 1, and we read this verse in Philippians quite often. We quote it, uh, and it's a, it's a wonderful verse, Philippians 1.6. Some of you can quote this verse, but when you read back the few verses before it, listen to what Paul writes to this church at Philippi, which he loved. Verse 3, I thank my God in all my remembrance of you, always offering prayer with joy in my every prayer for you all. The joy that he had, even in his prayer, in view of your participation in the gospel from the first day into now. For I am confident of this very thing, that he who began a good work in you will perfect it until the day of Christ Jesus. Okay, there you go. Some that, that have a real struggle with, with believing in eternal security, how could it be that God could make us eternally secure? The reason why he can say that is because he has started a work in a true believer's heart that will not fail until the finish. And then it won't fail, it just moves right into glory. And that's the joy, Paul, as he's writing about this church, the joy that he had as he thought about them in his prayers. That's what real joy is all about. What God has done. I know that I am going to fail. And I know that you are going to fail. Some of us may fail a little bit. Some of us may fail a great deal. Beloved, God will never fail you. And that is the source of our joy. Now, as I think about this word, J-O-Y, of course, there's several acronyms that come to mind. J-O-Y, Jesus, others, and you. Jesus over you. Jesus owns you. But my very favorite of all that I ran across this week was Jesus J zero O and you. There is nothing, nothing that can stand between Jesus and you. And that's the real source of joy, if you have it, if you know it. Romans chapter 14 and verse 17 says, For the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking, but it's three things. And these three things really define the character of a Christian, a true Christian. Kingdom of God is not eating and drinking, but righteousness peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. Righteousness, when you choose to do the right thing because it is the right thing, what follows that is a peace about the fact that I've made that decision and the peace of God fills our hearts in that, followed by a joy that the Holy Spirit gives us. Now, with those preliminary statements about joy, I want us to look now at Luke 2. And we're going to see in five different points, five different steps in, this, in these 20 verses, we're going to see the origin of joy. Let's look first of all at the first three verses, and we'll look at the decree. Now in those days, a decree went out from Caesar Augustus. Caesar Augustus was the grand nephew of Julius Caesar. Of all of the Caesars, maybe he was the best of them. That's not saying very much. But he, he gave a decree that a census be taken of all the inhabited earth. This was the first census taken while Quirinus was governor of Syria. And everyone was on his way to register for the census, each to his own city. 
basically a census, boiling it down to the bottom line, a census was given to raise money. Not only to raise money, because as you go and as you were registered, of course there was a registration tax. But also, an emperor wanted to, a king wanted to see what size his army could be. So all of these, these issues uh, go into this, why Caesar Augustus decreed this census. But I want to tell you that there is another reason why he did this. And if you'll back up to the little book of Micah, Micah chapter 2, or chapter 5, and listen to these verses beginning with verse 2. This was written by one of the latter prophets in Israel. And this was a prophecy that this man gave about something that's going to happen in the future, a something and a somewhere. Listen to these verses. But as for you, Bethlehem Ephrata, too little to be among the clans of Judah, from you one will go forth for me to be a ruler in Israel. His goings forth are from long ago, from the days of eternity. Therefore, he will give them up until the time when she who is in labor has borne a child. Then the remainder of his brethren will return to the sons of Israel. He will arise and shepherd his flock in the strength of the Lord, in the majesty of the name of the Lord his God. And they will remain because at that time he will be great to the ends of the earth. This one will be our peace. I want to say this to you, that there was a decree behind the decree. Yes, the scripture says that this man, Caesar Augustus, made a decree, but what was the decree behind his decree? It was God fulfilling his own purpose. And one of the favorite verses to really talk about this in the New Testament is in the book of Ephesians. And listen to these words. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, Ephesians chapter 1, verses 1 to 11. To the saints who are at Ephesus and who are faithful in Christ Jesus, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. Just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him in love. He predestined us to adoption as sons through Jesus Christ to himself, according to the kind intention of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, which he freely bestowed on us in the Beloved. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished on us in all wisdom and insight. He made known to us the mystery of his will according to his kind intention, which he purposed in him with a view to the administration suitable to the fullness of the times, that is, the summing up of all things in Christ, things in the heavens and things on the earth. In him we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to his purpose, his decree, who works all things after the counsel of his will. To the end that we who were the first to hope in Christ would be to the praise of his glory, in whom you also, after listening to the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation, having also believed, you were sealed in him with the Holy Spirit of promise. Beloved, I want to tell you that this decree in Luke chapter 2 was a God thing. And he used man to make this decree. The man had it in his purpose and in his mind to raise money, to fill the treasure. But God had behind this a decree. He was going to have his son be born in Bethlehem, period. 
And when God speaks, beloved, it is going to happen. So we see the decree. Secondly, let's look at the destination. Verse 4. So Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the city of Nazareth, to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and family of David, in order to register along with Mary, who was engaged to him and was with child. Now, this destination is interesting to me. I've done the math. It's about 90 miles from uh, Nazareth up to Bethlehem. Now, ladies, it doesn't, you don't have to be very smart to get this. I mean, I got it. You're, uh, you're in your last trimester of pregnancy. You're perhaps almost completed. And your husband says, let's go to Bethlehem. And let's go and get registered. Let's get there before the baby comes. Makes sense, doesn't it? Except that 90 miles on a burrow, on a horse, even on a buckboard, all the bouncing, come on, the baby's going to be born in the first five miles. <laughs> but it wasn't because God held that baby in check until his time would happen. And here they are going to this town, this special town that God had said in the Old Testament he would be born in. Bethlehem, which means in the Hebrew, house of bread. Think of the symbolism of bread. The bread in the wilderness, the manna that fed the people, it was their sustenance through the wilderness. The fact that Jesus would come, be born in a town, he would become the bread of heaven, the bread of life that sustains our spiritual life. So this destination here is a very special location. Thirdly, notice the details of the birth. Notice verse 7. She gave birth to her firstborn son. And I make this point uh, in the Greek language. There, there are specific words for firstborn and only born. This is the word. This was the first of many children. We don't know how many she had, but we know the, the gospel writers mentioned that Jesus had brothers and sisters. So this was a full family, Jesus being the oldest. We are told that Mary and Joseph remained in an engaged state in verse 5 until the time of the baby, which means there was no other consummation here. So we know that's specific from these verses. But look at the details of the birth. She wrapped him in cloths, bandages, and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. Now, of course, the question is, where did she get the, the cloths to wrap him in? And the answer is, her diaper bag. <laughs> We're not the first to invent things. I mean, they know they're going to be on the trail. They have no idea for sure that this baby would be born there. This is a God thing to get them there. But they were just going on their own uh, obedience to fulfill the laws of the land, which this is just another illustration that we should obey the law. This righteous man, Joseph, and his wife, they were obeying the law here. But they had prepared for this birth, and they had all the necessary things that they needed. I just think it's interesting. I don't find anywhere where God told them that they would have that baby there, the when and the where. It might be there, and I, I may have missed it, but the way I pic picture this is just good judgment and common sense. They were prepared for when this baby would be born. And can you imagine this, this entourage of Joseph and, and Mary and them coming with their, with their animal or two and here they're, they're being watched by the heavenly angels protecting them all along the way, getting them to the place where they need to be. And I believe this about God. I believe that if you are a Christ follower and you are walking according to the pattern of the life that God is calling you to, I think that God has his hand on you and I think you can trust him. 
I don't care what happens. I don't care what happens in our world to shake us up, to pull the rug out from under us. If you have true faith and if you are following Christ, you can trust him. He's going to see you through. So fourthly, let's look at the declaration, which is the best part of this whole story. Verse eight, in the same region, there were some shepherds staying out in their fields and keeping watch over their flock by night. Now, I don't want to shatter anybody's uh, idea about Christmas time and Christ being born in December. We know almost for sure he wasn't born in December. This wasn't the time of year for sheep to be in a pasture and for a shepherd to be watching them by night. Um, most likely, Jesus was probably born in March or April. You say, well, what's the December 25 all about? And that goes all the way back to the early centuries where the church wanted something to offset a pagan festival on the 25th of December. And they said, well, let's just, let's just say that that's going to be the celebration of the birth of Christ. So when you read the passage here, it just kind of gives some questions in your mind. I don't think he was born in December, though we do celebrate it then. But they were out there keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord suddenly stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terribly frightened. Literally, the passage said, they feared a great fear. And the angel said to them, stop being afraid, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy, mega Cairo, great joy, which will be for all the people. Definite article in front of the word people, a specific people. This Savior was sent to the Jews first. He was sent to them to open their eyes, to lead them back to God. They rejected him. But please know this, that he was sent first and foremost to them. But then later we come into the picture for in the next verse it says, For today in the city of David there has been born for you, for the shepherds, for all of us, a Savior who is Christ the Lord. This will be a sign for you. And then he, he goes and he gives them how they're going to find this baby. This was the declaration of great good news for all the people because a Savior was coming. A baseball player was met by an angel after his game, and the angel appeared to him, kind of scared him at first. And he looked at the man, and he said, I've got some good news, and I've got some bad news. And the baseball player, in his shock, said, well, I don't know. Give, give me the good news first. He said, well, there is baseball in heaven. And he said, well, good. I'm, I'm really glad to know that. And What's the bad news? He said, well, you're, you're pitching tonight. So sometimes good news is good news and bad news is bad news. But this good news here, what does it mean? What does it mean to us? First of all, it says a Savior has been given to the world and to you. Now, this announcement, this declaration came. I think this is significance. It came to the shepherds first. Do you know anything about shepherds in the New Testament? This probably one or two rungs under a tax collector. They were a despised group. They were so despised they could not testify in court. Their testimony wasn't believed. They were known for arriving at the market with more sheep than what they started with. Matter of fact, they were suspected of confusing thine with mine. And so because of that, this group of men, they had a terrible reputation. Secondly, they didn't really keep the Mosaic law. They didn't keep any laws of cleanliness. Matter of fact, they all smelled like their sheep. You know, that's not a bad thing for a shepherd to smell like the sheep. Woe unto the shepherd 
that, that walks on a higher plane than the sheep, that doesn't smell like his people, that feels like he stands above his people. But these shepherds, they were despised, much like a group of gypsies would be. So why did he appear to them first? I think Jesus answers it in his own words where he says, I have not come to call the righteous, but the sinners to repentance. God just simply loves to dispense his grace. Do you need it this morning? Do you need the grace of God? Do you need the mercy of God? because of your sin and you know what your sin is and you need God's mercy to forgive you. That's what he does best. God didn't need a fanfare of good religious holy men to announce the birth of Christ. Why, he could have, he could have signaled every single bell in the town of Bethlehem to start ringing and every light flashing and every candle automatically lit. He could have had a star right above the, 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 the temple. But that wasn't his plan for the birth of his son. He doesn't need a show. And neither does the church. It makes me nauseous when I see how much show is going into what is called church today. I thank you as a congregation that you've never put that load on me to give us a show to make it more than just the word of God explained. Well, I guess the greater question might be to us, why did God send his son to us? And go back to chapter one, and I want to show you in verse eight to 17, and I want to answer that question just by reading these verses. Verse 8, now it happened that while he was performing his priestly service before God in the appointed order of his division, according to the custom of his priestly office, he was chosen by lot to enter the temple of the Lord and burn incense. And the whole multitude of the people were in prayer outside at the hour of the incense offering. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him, standing to the right of the altar of incense. Boy, that must have been a shock. You're in there by yourself in this temple, dimly lit temple. And all of a sudden, someone's just sidled right up beside of you, and they're standing there. Well, of course, Zechariah was troubled when he saw the angel, and fear gripped him. And the angel said, do not be afraid, Zacharias, for your petition has been heard. And your wife, Elizabeth, will bear you a son. You will give him the name John. You will have joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth. For he will be great in the sight of the Lord. He will drink no wine or liquor. He will be filled with the Holy Spirit while yet in his mother's womb. And he will turn many of the sons of Israel back to the Lord their God. It is he who will go as a forerunner before him in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers back to the children and the disobedient to the attitude of the righteous so as, and here it is, to make a people ready and prepared for the Lord. This is the reason. God sent us a Savior. He sent us Jesus to show us the way, to prepare us for the Lord. Beloved, this morning, if all you have is religion, you're not prepared to stand before a holy, wrathful God. If all you had is, 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 is what my grandmother had, and that's all you have, and you're carrying that as though it's your own, you have no chance before a holy God. But beloved, we have been prepared by Jesus himself. While mankind is lost in their own sinful selves without remedy, we name the name of Jesus and he is our savior. That's the first thing I'm going to say as I stand before Simon Peter as those gates of heaven open up. I'm going to say the word Jesus. 
He's my Savior, and that's why I'm here. In the 1980s, in Winona Lake, Indiana, a family who didn't believe in medicine let their 13-year-old lovely daughter die. She could have been saved for $11 worth of penicillin. They had the remedy. They had the cure. And they failed to take it. They wouldn't trust it. They wouldn't believe it. Same thing is true for anyone who rejects Jesus Christ. He is the Savior. He is the remedy. Well, we've seen a little bit about the decree and the decree behind the decree. We've seen a little bit about the destination, that lovely town of Bethlehem, which, by the way, is the size of Hanson. And I didn't mention this to you, but it doesn't tell us as the shepherds made their discovery, it didn't tell us that they went straight to the place. I have an idea that the scripture does tell us they went in a hurry, but I have an idea they went to every barn stable and they were all over the places, just like we have garages for our cars. They had stables, barns, caves, any places they could have for their animals. I can just see these guys feverishly looking and to find. But then we have the discovery. Scripture says here that they were in the same region in the area of Bethlehem. And there they began their search. And as I thought about this word, search, I wonder how many of us here are seeking after God, are wanting more of God. I wonder how many of us are running away from God. I wonder if there's anyone here and you're, you've been waiting to find Jesus. What's holding you back? Is the preponderance of evidence not enough to convince you that this man is indeed the Savior of the world? Haven't you seen Jesus in a true Christ follower? Haven't you noticed that a person who's truly saved, we're not perfect, we make mistakes all the time, but there should be a different level of joy and attitude from the heart of a Christ follower. Maybe the problem is, maybe you've just seen the make-believer who wears invisible clothes like the emperor, naked but thinking he's clothed. I guess I can say this, sadly say this, by looking at some so-called Christians, I wouldn't believe either. Why? Why believe if I don't see the true redeemed? Well, Jeremiah wrote these words a long time ago, and here's what he said to a people getting ready to go in captivity. They're going to have 70 years worth of trouble but that trouble would come to an end. And during the trouble, here's what he said they could expect. You will seek me and find me when you search for me with your whole heart. We know in this story of Luke chapter 2 that their discovery was something incredible. And it says here in this in this discovery, as they, as they found uh, the baby. And it says, when they'd seen this, they found their way to Mary and Joseph, verse 16, as the baby, he lay in the manger. When they had seen this, they made known the statement which had been told them about the child. And all who heard it wondered at the things which were told them by the shepherd. Why did they wonder? It's obvious. These were shepherds. You don't believe a shepherd. And they're just trying to figure out this doesn't make sense. Why would God choose this, these people to tell us this news? But Mary treasures all these things, pondering them in her heart. The shepherds went back, and here's their discovery, glorifying and praising God for all that they had heard and seen, just as it had been told them. When I see a person coming to faith, true faith, 
When I see a person surrender and lay down their life to the Lord Jesus Christ, to say, Jesus, I am a sinner. I'm in need of your salvation and your grace. Here I am. When I see that, and it's real, I see that what follows that are these two things. A person giving glory to God and a person whose life is all about praise and thank you. People who are giving glory to God are thankful people. And this is the whole picture in my heart of what it means to have joy. I hope this morning you have him as your Savior. I hope that if you've embraced him, he is what he said he was. He is the Son of God, Savior of the world. I hope you believe this. This morning, as we think about this Christmas story on joy, I hope as this quiet music plays that you'll think about and ponder in your heart, okay, what does God want me to do? And the scripture simply says, believe, trust, and obey. And as we come to him this morning, if you haven't opened your heart and your life to trust him for your future and your salvation, now's as good a time as any. In the quietness of these moments, just lift your heart up to God. Tell him all about it. And maybe for someone here, uh, maybe you need to get refocused. Get your eyes off of the commercial. Get your eyes off of the superficial and start getting that joy deep down that comes from realizing a Savior has been born. And we could sing as Rufus and the group so well saying hallelujah to that. Let's bow our heads as we think about this.